So today's event uh, is the second in a three-part series entitled Reconsidering the Greek Revolution uh, in tribute to the 200th anniversary of the Greek Revolution, which is of course tomorrow. So this event is particularly timely in fact. Um, and this series is part of the seminar on modern Greek literature and culture through the Mahindra Humanities Center. Uh, so today, um, this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are, um, I have the great honor of introducing our speakers, uh, Stratos um, Ethimiu and Paniotis Roilos. Um, Mr. Ethimiu has graciously agreed to offer some opening remarks, uh, after which Professor Roilos will speak. Um, so Stratos Ethimiu is currently the Consul uh, General of Greece in Boston, um, also in association with the Hellenic Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Prior to this position, he served as the spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and director of its Information and Public Diplomacy Department from 2016 to 2017. Uh, he holds a master's degree in international relations and a diploma in political sciences from the Institute of Political Studies of Paris. Um, and during the time of his studies, he also worked as a journalist. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ethimiu, for joining us today. Um, I would next like to introduce Paniotis Roilos, who is the George Seferis Professor of Modern Greek Studies and Professor of Comparative Literature at Harvard, um, who also happens to be my academic advisor. Um, in addition to chairing this seminar, he also co-chairs the Cultural Politics Seminar at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs with um, Dimitrios Yatromanolakis. He is also a faculty associate for the Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies at Harvard. Um, as well as the founder and director of the Delphi Academy of European Studies. And he is a member of the Greece 2021 National Committee. Uh, committee rather. Uh, so the title of his talk today is Harvard and Philhellenism. Um, so thank you so much to you both for speaking to us today on what promises to be an extremely salient topic and very um, topical indeed. Um, before I turn the floor over to um, Mr. Ethimiu, I would ask that everyone join me in a round of virtual applause uh, to welcome our speakers today. Thanks, Elena. Okay. So uh, good evening everybody from uh, uh, the Consulate uh, General of Greece uh, in Boston and uh, uh, I would like to thank and praise uh, Professor Roy Laws, the outstanding uh, George Seferis Chair at Harvard, for this uh, really timely and meaningful initiative. Uh, Professor Roy Laws' uh, lecture is very significant because it uh, sheds light on the multiple connections and the thread united the values uh, uh, that uh, uh, united that the values that unite Harvard through the study of classical Greece with the birth of the modern uh, Greek state. And tomorrow, as uh, Boston bridges and public monuments and the Museum of Fine Arts will be illuminated in blue honoring uh, Greece, we will be holding uh, a ceremony at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, uh, paying tribute to Everett and Howe, uh, two of the towering Philin. Uh, Harvard figures connected to Greece. And uh, congratulations, Professor, for this uh, initiative. I think the, uh, the experts should, uh, uh, should uh, say more than those who are not. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Consul General. Thank you, Ilana. This year marks the 200th anniversary of the beginning of the Greek revolution against the Ottoman Turks. A revolution that resulted in the foundation of the Greek state. But the foundation of the Greek state does not of course coincide with the beginnings of the formation of modern Hellenism. 
The beginnings of the formation of modern Hellenism go back, as I have argued on a number of occasions, already to the late 15th century. There is almost no decade in the three centuries between the fall of the Byzantine Empire and the Greek Enlightenment of the late 18th century, in which Greeks, mainly scholars of the diaspora, but also scholars living in the Ottoman Empire, would not appeal to influential figures of European political and cultural life <clears throat> to help them liberate themselves from the Turks. We at Harvard, at the Joseph Ferris Chair of Modern Greek Studies, commemorate this extraordinary landmark in Greek history with a series of events that will take place throughout the calendar year. Let me mention first the series Reconsidering the Greek Revolution at the Seminar on Modern Greek Studies at the Mahindra Humanities Center. Scholars from different fields and from different countries are invited to contribute their insights on cultural, political, ideological, historical aspects of the Greek Revolution and its impact on the formation of contemporary Greek culture and society and on European politics as a whole. A selection of these presentations will appear in an edited volume. In the fall, an event on the long lasting impact of the Greek Revolution and the position of Greece in Europe today will be organized in collaboration with the Consul General, Mr. Stratos of Thimiu, and with the Weather Here Center for International Affairs, where I happen to be a faculty associate, and with the participation of the director of the Weather Here Center, my dear colleague, Michelle Amont, and of Mrs. Yana Angelopoulou, the president of the Greece 2021 Committee. Several other events will also be scheduled in close collaboration with Dr. Calliope Duru, the preceptor in modern Greek at Harvard, and my graduate students. Here, let me express my gratitude to Ilana Friedman and to Andrew Tapalis, both graduate coordinators of the Seminar on Modern Greek Studies at the Mahindra Center for the Humanities here at Harvard. Any kind of anniversary tends to activate, I argue, a ritually inflected experiencing of time. It marks a break in the normal flow of time. As a rule, an anniversary entails an inflated dialectical intercrossing of temporal orders. The past filters through to the present and through its transformative revisiting by the latter, it shapes aspects of the present's imaginary pre-enactment of the future. Anniversaries are occasions for re-examining the past and pondering present and future opportunities and challenges. In the first two centuries of its history, the Greek nation state, which I repeat, does not coincide with the formation of modern Hellenism, has accomplished extraordinary achievements on many fronts, geopolitical, political, social, cultural. It has tripled its territory. It has become an active member of major international alliances and unions, notably of the EU. It has become the country of major representatives of world culture. Let me mention here, for instance, George Ferris, Odysseus Elitis, Nikos Kazantzakis, Yanis Richos, of course, Maria Callas, Manus Kazidakis, Mikis Todorakis, Gilles Dassin, Michalis Kakoyanis, and more recently, Lanthimos. Today, Greece faces serious socioeconomic and geopolitical challenges, especially in its eastern boundaries. Some of those challenges may attest to a number of omissions or mistakes on the part of some of its leaders. But today, I shall not dwell on those achievements, challenges, or opportunities. These are the subjects of some of the events which, as I mentioned above, will take place here at Harvard, Joseph Ferry Chair and Program of Modern Greek Studies throughout this year. Today, I would like to focus on a major factor which, along with the heroism and sacrifices of the Greek fighters 
and the inviolable involvement of the Greek diaspora in the independence cause was of great, was of great importance for the success of the revolution. I mean, the cultural and political phenomenon of Philhellenism. Today, I want to address Harvard's significant contribution to international Philhellenism. I would thus like to transfer you back to 1828, seven years after the outbreak of the Greek Revolution. In January 1828, Ioannis Kapodistrias, who had been elected as the governor of Greece by the Greek National Assembly in Trizin almost one year earlier, in April 1827, arrived in Nathplio. The same year, in 1828, a fighter and officer of the Greek Revolution and scholar, Alexandros Negris, began teaching the modern Greek language at Harvard. Negris, who happened to be also a nephew of two of the most important leaders of the Greek Revolution, Alexandros and Dimitrios Ypsilantis, had arrived in Boston in late 1827. In 1828, Nevis also published his grammar of the modern Greek language, Synoptiki tis Apolinikis Dialectu Grammatiki, here in Boston. Although it could not lay any claim to scholarly rigor or originality, the Negris grammar is important for its cultural and historical value, I argue. It should be viewed as an example of an early cultural political program that aimed at familiarizing American scholars and students with the culture and language of the inhabitants of the newly established Greek state. The politically resuscitated descendants of the glorious ancient Greeks at least in the imaginary of the Greek literati and of the Philhellenes. The main corpus of Negri's grammar was preceded by a bilingual introduction in which he did not fail to compare the recent heroic feats of his compatriots with those of the ancients. One of the target groups of his grammar, he emphasizes, were prospective travelers who now, after the liberation of the Greeks, would visit that ancient land much more frequently than ever before. He envisions them, quote, flocking to Greece, the common mother of civilized nations, confortismenon ethnon kinin mitera, drawn by a liberal curiosity to become acquainted not only with the land that at different times has been so conspicuous as the nursery of great men, Iran and Edith Vittorian, but also with a nation that at the present day, while it dwells on the same soil and converses in the same speech as its ancestors, worthily emulates also their noble acts." End quote. And Negris concludes his parole with the following, Parigoria mu megisti in istas polas dystichias me monomenos esterimenos patridos ke filon Τον εξέφερο την σπουδήν τη γλώσσα μου, ει την οποία αναγεννήθησαν ετέχνε και επιστήμε, καλλιεργουμένη ει ένα νέο ημισφαίριο. Και όλη μου κατά το παρόν η φιλοδοξία περιορίζεται ει το να εμπορώ να υπό ότι πρώτο ει του φιλομαθεί και φιλοκάλου ενέπνευσα Αμερικανού την επιθυμία του να σπουδάζω σε την καθημερινή. Amidst my various misfortunes and my separation from my country, kindred and friends, it is no small consolation to me to find the Greek language in general, the mother of the liberal arts and sciences, so much cultivated in the new hemisphere. And my present ambition will be fully satisfied if I can claim the credit of being the first to inspire men of learning and taste in America with the desire of becoming familiar with, with the living dialect of Greece. Also in 1828, a major scholar in the field of Greek linguistics arrived at Boston. I mean, Evangelinos 
Apostolides Sophocles, who, according to the Dutch scholar Dirk Hesseling, was destined to become the first Neo Hellenist. Sophocles had attended the Greek school in Miles, a town not far from his native Tsagarades on Mount Pelion in Thessaly. He was fortunate to have as teachers in Miles two of the most important figures of the Greek Enlightenment, Arthimos Gazis and Rivorius Constantas. After spending several years at Yale, Sophocles returned to Boston and became his teacher at Harvard in 1842. He was promoted to full professor in 1860. Upon his return to Boston in 1842, Sophocles published his own grammar of modern Greek, his Romaic grammar, as he calls it. His opus magnum is the Greek lexicon of the Roman and Byzantine periods from 146 BC to 1100 AD, which remains extremely useful even today. But Nedris and Sophocles would not have thrived at Harvard if that important American education institution had not become a most hospitable place for all things Greek due mainly to the enthusiastic and genuine Philhellenism of the Hellenist Edward Everett. Harvard had produced another fervent Philhellen, Samuel Gridley Howe. After graduating from Harvard Medical School in 1824, Howe went to Greece where he offered his services as a doctor at the Greek army. After three years, he returned to the States and raised a great amount of money for the support of the fighting Greeks. In 1828, he published his historical sketch of the Greek Revolution. He remained an enthusiastic friend of Greece until the end of his life in 1876. But this afternoon, I want to focus on Everett's advocacy of his contemporary Greek struggle for political emancipation and cultural development. Born in Dorchester, Massachusetts in 1794, Everett was admitted to Harvard College when he was only 13 years old, and he was destined to become the university's 16th president between 1846 and 1848. The precocious scholar who graduated as the valedictorian of his class devoted a deep inter developed a deep interest in contemporary Greece, its culture and language very early. Already in 1813, he published an extremely interesting article in the General Repository and Review. His approach to Greek culture and history was conspicuously influenced by their idealization by major representatives of Romanticism and the Enlightenment, most notably by Lord Byron and Adamandius Correis, the patriarch of the Greek Enlightenment. From the very beginning of his discussion, Everett singles out Greek and Hebrew as the only two ancient languages that, as he says, have remained alive until modern times. The difference between ancient and modern Greek he argues, is not perhaps much greater than between the Attic and the Doric dialects of the former. Everett corroborates his argument by comparing the development of the Greek language with English and French. Changes in the latter two in the last four centuries, he emphasizes, are not less than those in the Greek tongue in its very, very long history. However, being acquainted with Coase's views about the need for the formation of a middle puristic linguistic register, Catharebusa, which would bridge archaizing with the vernacular Greek, Everett notes that he's aware of the fact that the spoken language of contemporary Greeks has been contaminated with barbarous, as he calls them, borrowings from foreign peoples, Italians, Russians, but especially Turks. His description of lexical connections of contemporary Greek with other languages is replete with metaphors of contagion. 
drawing from Dukhansi's views of the different levels of medieval and early modern Greek, as these views were put forward in Dukhansi's introduction to his famous 1688 dictionary, Glossarium at Scriptores Mendie et Infirme, Goekitatis, Every discerns three main linguistic registers of modern Greek. First, archaic Greek employed by many literati. Second, the register used in liturgical and other ecclesiastical texts. And finally, the proper Romaic, as he calls it, which is checkered with words of all tongues and deformed with auxiliary particles. It is the dialect of commercial intercourse and of the common people, Everett explains. Everett devotes a considerable and the most engaging part of his discussion to what I would call his cultural political approach to the Greek case. Linguistic and broader cultural renaissance in Greece would happen only if the Greeks become independent. Cultural progress and freedom go hand in hand, he professes, in a manner recalling most notably Corace's views. This approach to Greek cultural tradition and contemporary politics was shared by the majority of Greek literati and the Philelines alike, in whose imaginary Greece, its present and its glorious past, had been shaped under the influence of the Enlightenment and the Romanticism. Quote, that the language could be restored to its primitive purity without restoring liberty and perhaps independence to those who have to speak it may be doubted, Everett emphasizes. In the context of his cultural political discussion, Everett refers also to the plans of Catherine the Great, the Russian Empress, for the liberation of the Greeks of course, here he uh, he's referring to the, to the 1770 Olaf revolt. Catherine was thinking, Everett stresses, of appointing her own son as king of the Greek nation after its independence. She had ordered, he adds, that her young son learn the spoken Greek language of the time and not ancient Greek. In his attempt to convince his readers that contemporary Greeks are indeed worthy of their glorious heritage and capable of achieving their cultural resuscitation, Everett praises the educational initiatives of Greek scholars and the literary production of Greek writers. He provides useful information about the teaching of the Greek letters in different cities and towns of the Ottoman Empire, as well as translations of ancient Greek and European works into modern Greek. He refers, for instance, to the activities of the scholar Benjamin Lesvius. Benjamin uh, Lesvius was a teacher at the famous Greek uh, school in Kidonies, a Valik in Asia Minor. He refers also to the patrons of Greek letters, the Babadres Dosimas from Mipibus, to Panagiotis Kodrikas, to Athanasius Christopoulos, the influential Greek poet. Christopoulos was also the author of the Grammatiki tis Eolodovikis, Iti tis Omilumenis, Torinis ton Elinon Glossas, that is, grammar of the Eolodoric dialect, that is, of the spoken Greek language of today, and also to Athanasius Psalidas. He does not forget to refer to Logius Irmis either, the journal that was launched in Vienna under the guidance of Ramantius Correis only two years before the publication of Everett's article, that is in 1811. Everett singles out Corais as the most significant and influential Greek scholar of the time. He praises especially his initiative to produce editions of ancient Greek authors. These short notices of the Greek literati, Everett stresses, may convince us that there is something in motion for the, for, the, for the improvement of their, that is the Greeks race, and gives us ground to hope that if a conjunction of foreign affairs should favor their restoration, they will not at least be wanting to themselves. 
end of quote. In their current situation, Greeks, quote, are forbidden to speak and if possible, to think on all those topics of moral and political interest which engage so much attention in other countries. But for all his Hellenic enthusiasm, Everett could not help deploring the cultural degeneration of the inhabitants of his contemporary Athens. He cites a well-known distich, which he apparently drew from Byron's comments of the second canto of his Charlie Howard's pilgrimage. The whole Attic race, Everett admits, following Byron's lead, is barbarous even to the proverb, O Athena, Protichova, Ti Gaidarus, the Befistova. Indicative of Everett's attempt to engage his readers' interest in modern Greek letters is his compilation of a list of Greek books housed at the Boston Ateneum. Of special interest, I think, is his reference to the rendition of the New Testament into vernacular Greek by Maximus uh, Kalipolitis in uh, the 1630s. Uh, Everett is familiar only with the first name of the translator. The name of the author is Maximus, which is all we know of him or it. It is not probably of critical value, Everett adds. But he mentions that a fine copy of Maximus' translation existed also in the library of Harvard College, where is also a lexicon of the Romaic and Italian languages, which appears to be copious and is the work also of Somavera. This must be one of the earliest, or perhaps even the earliest, at least known to me, concrete reference to a collection of books of modern Greek interest at Harvard's libraries. 10 years after that first article in 1823, Everett published another important piece prompted by the recent edition of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics by Adamantius Correis. In that second article, which appeared two years before Everett was elected a member of the House of Representatives, we may detect a noteworthy shift of his perspective on the Greek cause toward more pragmatic considerations. Although still under the influence of Romanticism and advocating the importance of Greek cultural and linguistic continuity, Everett employs more down-to-earth arguments to convince his readers that the Greeks deserve the Americans' sympathy and active support. Now, his emphasis is placed not so much on the need of the Greek people to resuscitate their ancestral cultural glory, as rather on their exemplification of an archetypal sort of struggle of Christians against whatever it calls infidels, a struggle of slaves eager to live up to the standards of modern civic societies against atrocious, uncivilized, as Everett calls them, masters and conquerors. No doubt, this polarization had shaped the imaginary of most Greek fighters and the Philhellenes. By using such arguments, Everett aimed at appealing to the republicanist values of his fellow Americans. It is not fortuitous that his advocacy of the Greek cause had a great impact on the congressman, Daniel Webster. Inspired by Everett, Webster delivered a memorable speech at the American Congress supporting the Greek revolution, in fact, the Greek independence. Everett portrayed the uprising of the Greeks against the Turks as an exemplification of the American ideals of liberty and civil and political rights. Addressing his fellow Americans, Everett highlighted the impact of their own revolution on the Greek one. Commenting on a letter signed on the 25th of March, 1821, that he had received from the Messinian Senate of Kalamata, Messiniaki, Jerusalem, and Kalamata, which he translates into English, Everett emphasizes, 
Oh. Such an appeal of the anxious conclave of self-devoted patriots in the inaccessible cliffs of the Moria must bring, must bring home to the mind of the least reflecting American the great and glorious part which this country is to act in the political regeneration of the world. We have seen the oldest and most splendid monarchy in Europe, of course, he means France, casting off its yoke under the contagion of liberty caught from us. Through France, the influence of our example has been transmitted to the other European states. From the venerated plains of Greece and from the scarcely explored range of the Cordilleras, a voice of salutation and a cry for sympathy are resounding in our ears." End of quote. Everett urges Americans to recognize the independence of Greece as they did for the South American independence. It's interesting that in that article, Everett undertakes also to refute the negative comments of some European travelers on the cultural and moral state of contemporary Greeks. According to Everett, the most judicious voice of Republican and modernizing political ideas among the Greeks was Adamantius Correis. Correis, with whom Everett had some interesting correspondence, was born in Smyrna in 1748 and spent most of his life in France. In 1805, Correis launched his most important editorial project, his Hellenic Library. In the announcement of that project, he emphasized that it is only pedia, education, that may enlighten people and free them, among other evils, from poverty too. The only kind of superiority that really matters, Correis argued, is superiority in pedia, education, culture and virtue. In the 22 years that that series, the Hellenic Library last, Correis published 16 editions and nine additional supplementary volumes. A number of literary genres were represented in that series, rhetoric, philosophy, historiography, poetry, geography, even the genre of the novel and several authors, both major and so-called minor ones, Homer, Tuteus, Aesop, Isocrates, Plato, Aristotle, Xenophon, Lycurgus, Strabo. This was the result of a formidable scholarly energy, passion, and vision. His editions were accompanied by commentaries and, most important, by systematic introductions which were not only philological treatises, but also significant works of political philosophy. In fact, he would call those introductions improvised reflections on Greek culture and language. Through the Hellenic Library, Correis wanted to make select texts of Greek antiquity accessible not only to specialists, but also, or even primarily, to the broadest possible audience many among his compatriots. With that vision in mind, and certainly at the expense of his own reputation as an international leading scholar in the field, Correis wrote his commentaries and introductions not in Latin as was the established practice in the field of classical philology or in any other major um, modern European language, but in modern Greek in his characteristic idiom that constituted a middle linguistic register between archaizing and demotic Greek. Although his decision to use modern Greek in his editions was criticized by European colleagues of his, it no doubt contributed to his passionate vision of disseminating ancient Greek literature and thought to his oppressed fellow Greeks. By the way, as I have argued on several other occasions, Correis' cultural political program may compare to similar initiatives of 16th century Greek scholars. Indicative of Correis' unique combination of strictly scholarly acuity with a broader cultural political ingenuity, 
was also his introduction to the edition of the ancient Greek novel, Heliodorus's Ethiopia, Ethiopian story. Although that work was a fictional text, a rather minor work according to prevailing scholarly views at the time with no specific obvious political, moral or historical relevance for contemporary Greeks, Correis used it as an example of the creativity of ancient Greek literature, which prefigured similar but much later literary developments in Western Europe. To his mind, that work should be followed as an inspiring model by his modern compatriots, who by definition, Correis stresses, were the true inheritors of the cultural achievements of their ancestors, including the invention and cultivation of the genre of the novel. Literature, Correis implies, is an important constituent of a nation's cultural life. To his mind, the degree of literary sophistication and development reflects a nation's overall progress. His edition of Heliodorus's novel should thus be viewed as an important part of his overarching cultural and political program as a kind of manifesto that was influenced by a major enlightenment ideal, that of education and intellectual freedom and sophistication. Corrisi's concerns and care about the educational and overall cultural progress of his fellow Greeks were passionately presented in a speech that he gave at the French Society, the Observers of Man, in January 1803. In that lecture, Corrisi commended the cultural achievements of his compatriots who were living under the Turks. He also undertook to refute the views of those Europeans who will who still would perceive contemporary Greeks as semi-barbarians, unworthy of the glorious heritage of their ancestors. It is true that at that period, European Philhellenism had not developed yet. Even Lord Byron, who later would give his life for the Greek cause, at the beginning was under the influence of negative preconceptions about the modern descendants of the classical Greeks. In 1810, Byron wrote about the Greeks, quote, their plausible rascals with all the Turkish vices without their courage, end of quote. Travelers to famous archeological sites in the country would often report their disappointment at their encounters with contemporary Greeks whom not rarely described in utterly racist terms. And you may recall that I mentioned before that Everett too undertakes to refute uh, such views in his 1823 article. In Corace's lecture delivered at the Society of the Observers of Man in Paris, he addressed also the inspiring impact of the French Revolution and the Enlightenment on the cultural activities of the Greeks. According to Corace, the political and cultural situation in Europe after the French Revolution made the dissemination of knowledge and cultural goods to the Greeks easier and much more effective than ever before. At the same time, Corais focused on the drastic role that the prosperity of Greek merchants, both in the diaspora, but also in the native Greek lands, especially on the Aegean islands, played in that educational revival. Um, he refers, for instance, to the foundation of uh, many Greek schools, to the translation of several books from uh, European languages or from ancient Greek into contemporary Greek. He emphatically stated in that lecture that in the years of the French Revolution, many more books of educational content and function appeared in Greece than all the centuries after the fall of the Byzantine Empire. The wise and heroic intellectual's commitment to the cause of his compatriots and the ideals of freedom, civic society, justice, equality, and pedia, education, was acknowledged beyond the boundaries of his nation and even beyond Europe, as, of course, 
those articles by Everett um, attest. It's also noteworthy that Coraes had some interesting correspondence also with Thomas Jefferson. On the 31st of October, 1823, just a few days after the appearance of Everett's article, Jefferson wrote a moving letter to Coraes. Allow me to conclude my talk this evening with the last paragraph of that letter, which I offer here as a small tribute, not only to that intellectual hero of modern Greece, Adamantius Coraes, but also to his American supporters. To Edward Everett, the sagacious president of Harvard, and to Thomas Jefferson, the inspired American statesman. Here are the words of Thomas Jefferson to Adamandius Coveys. I have thus, dear sir, according to your request, given you some thoughts on the subject of national government. They are the result of the observations and reflections of an octogenary who has passed 50 years of trial and trouble in the various grades of his country's service but the outlines that you'll better fill up and accommodate to the habits and circumstances of your countrymen, should they furnish a single idea which may be useful to them. While we offer to heaven the warmest supplications for the restoration of your countrymen to the freedom and science of their ancestors, permit me to assure yourself of the cordial esteem and high respect which I bear and cherish towards yourself personally. Thomas Jefferson. Many thanks.